Okay. So, th so this is Sifu Slim, and I have the pleasure this morning to speak with Coach Matt Hank, who's in Santa Monica. I am here in Oahu, not too far from where Obama's been staying for many years. Uh, he goes to Kailua. I'm in Kaneohe, and I am enjoying the trade winds when they're here and not sweating as much, but uh, my workouts from Santa Barbara went from non-sweating workouts to sweating workouts over in Hawaii, and I don't diminish the importance of sweating. It's just a new a new way to have to uh, to handle life because you can't just go from uh, your workout to work uh, or, or breakfast because you're drenched. You have to figure out how to dry off or shower off. So, uh, Coach, good to speak with you this morning, and uh, you're a busy man. So first, if you would uh, be so kind, tell us uh, a bit about your background, and then uh, then I'll ask you about your uh, your schedule. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so my background, I mean, I'm a strength and conditioning coach by trade. So that, that's really what I do full time. I work at Santa Monica College, um, training the athletes, student athletes on the campus there. Um, you know, prepping for their competition. Uh, but as well, I teach classes in the kinesiology department. So kind of a, a dual split there in, in terms of training athletes in the weight room on the field, have some academic responsibilities. Um, I'm also the uh, NSCA, Southern California State Director. So have some responsibilities there. And then you know, Maybe you could tell us uh, tell us about NSCA and and uh, and how that is uh, that degree and that uh, that organization is perceived in the industry of of fitness and strength. Right. Yeah. So it's called the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Um, I've been a member. Oh, geez, I don't know since two thousand three or four, and um, their kind of primary certification originally was for strength and conditioning coaches. Right, so individuals who train athletes, and they've also branched off and have done very well with personal training side, um, tactical strength and conditioning. So what kind of sets them apart, I think, is some of like the research and um, the academic application, as as well as people like myself who just train athletes for a living. So we kind of merge the two. So I think that's what kind of makes it, like I said, unique and different. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I understand. So you were uh, mentioning to me before we uh, got online here about the your schedule. I, I had the uh, uh, contact with you about a week ago, and I, you know, the the where I came from was perhaps out of left field. You hadn't heard about my project. You hadn't heard perhaps about the the statistic on the uh, that less than 10 percent, according to the research that I've done, over 5,000 athletes uh, anecdotally. Uh, are not doing uh, fitness on a regular basis after their performance years. This would include retired military, uh, high-performance physical people like dancers and general contractors, the heavy, heavy-duty physical people, high school, college, and pro athletes, uh, and they all say the same thing. Even some uh, recent special forces uh, people who had a uh, squad of 22, and they're on Facebook. You know, this is five months out of their program. And only five out of those 22, which puts it higher than 10 percent, but that's only five months out of their their heavy duty program. Uh, we're, we're maintaining that physical activity. So that was news to you, uh, in my opinion, correct? Yeah, I'd say so for sure. Um, I don't know, maybe just because it's kind of my inner circle of people. I think just like yourself, we just we work out every day and that's just what we do. So you wouldn't, you know, think about too much athletes at a high level than just dropping off out of nowhere. So yeah, definitely. So the, when you said we work out every day, my, my first uh, thought is that the people who are the high performance people are doing it for some specific reason, uh, which generally is not wellness. The, the specific uh, reason that a triathlete does it, uh, you know, like in the the 80s, more training was good. Mike Pig in that era, the, the more miles, the, the more endurance stuff they did was good. And, and so later that changed. And now they're doing sports-specific training. They're doing it scientifically. They're listening to the body. You know, things have changed. But in many respects, uh, the gymnastics and, and the Olympic sports uh, haven't changed. Uh, from a colleague, I heard that the women's gymnastics team has done so well partially because they're training excessively, in my opinion, 
uh, for their uh, mind and their body and perhaps their spirit, uh, even when they're injured. So going up to their competition, they're doing their entire routine on a daily basis. And this could be with stress fra fractures, with other body ailments. And what they've determined that fighting through the, that pain and doing their performance, that they can perform better on uh, competition day. That does not mean that they're doing good things to their body. So may maybe you could share your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, you know, we got to make a distinction that if you're at the highest of high level, <clears throat> uh, I mean, that's how they're putting food on their plate. That's how they're paying for mortgages. So, mm -hmm. you know, myself, if, I'm, if, I've, if I have a cold one day, I can't just call in every time I have a cold and say, hey, boss, I'm not going to come in and train the athletes today because I have a cold, mm -hmm. you know, or even injured. If I'm injured today, it doesn't matter. I got to go in for the most part. I mean, I have sick days. <clears throat> so, you know, I think it's the same thing. We got to still put it in context or perspective that, if they're the best of the best, it's for a reason. It's because they do things to their bodies that I wouldn't do to my body. You probably wouldn't do to your body. Um, the things that I do to my athletes at this point in my life, I wouldn't even do that to my body, really, to be honest with you. Um, you know, so I, th I think that's one of them. Once you get, you know, high school, you're doing something to your body. College, you're doing something even greater. Professional ranks. Um, I mean, at that point, you know, maybe God kind of puts you on earth here for this and your body's meant to handle these things and do these things so to speak yeah so yeah, yeah the the high performance you mentioned uh better performance equals better news from your uh, sports fans your teammates your coaches perhaps your parents and your significant other so i i get the performance uh, based direction um, one thing i asked a, a, a basketball player uh two months ago to try to sum up, I didn't have a chance to speak for 20 minutes on the subject. We had about four minutes, and at the end, he, he didn't quite get it, And uh, but he did go from 30 years of non-physical activity back about six months ago to working with uh, an organization down in Los Angeles, which is kind of a, a new organization for fitness. They've got a new method, just like CrossFit came out sometime a decade ago and came out with their new way of doing things. And so he got back into that, and he got excited. And so he understands for himself. And I said, so what about these other athletes? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, is it more important to train to win the big game and put it all on the line for that? Or is it more important to have a well life? And he said, there's no, no question. It's more important to have a well life. So maybe you could share your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, but again, it, he's an older individual. So with age comes wisdom, right? Like, so I think it's just, Again, perspective. Like I mostly only train right now 18 to 22 year olds, so they think they're invisible, invincible. You know, which I'm sure we did. I know I did when I was that age. Um, I think they'll look back on it with perspective, <laughs> just like all of us do. You know, I could like tell my friends now, give them advice about having kids. I couldn't give people advice about having kids eight years ago, five years ago, because I didn't have any kids. So I think it's kind of, I, I think that's kind of what it's at. Um, at the time, you would do anything to be the best in competition. And I'm sure, you know, athletes, football athletes who they get a concussion, but they go on the field later in life, they're going to regret that. I mean, that's they should, I'm assuming. Um, so, no, it makes sense. I think, like I said, with perspective comes greater understanding of maybe life's purpose. So the, you mentioned the performance and the, uh, the programming perhaps, of, of athletes. And then you also mentioned the word conditioning. So when I think of conditioning, one of the first words I, I think of is functionality. So is my, all of my body, the, from a cellular all the way to the, uh, the aggregate of my body, is it working? Uh, if the chiropractor lines me up on, on his uh, chart and, and the plumb line against the wall or on his table, am I in alignment? When I go out on a long run, am I feeling good at doing that? Am I running using fat as fuel, perhaps, predominantly? And is my, is my posture and proprioception, all these things, are they, are they working? And when I go to help someone move, can I lift the things with him in an intelligent way and be efficient and do a good day's work and feel that that good day's work is actually helping my body, not just breaking it down? So I kind of lead with functionality, perhaps, um, because I was injury prone and I mentioned to you that I'm, I'm more of a Gilligan body so 
uh, the, you know, heavy duty work and, and, and running into someone in football and uh, even in soccer was never easy for me. I wasn't like a, an impact person, but I did do a lot of impact. So when I got tweaked and, and twisted in these activities and, and injured, I couldn't play. And there, there I was on the sidelines, miserable. So I learned about functionality and rehabilitation early on, and that, and that made a lot of sense to me. Uh, so maybe you could weigh in on that. Um, yeah, no, I think, I mean, my body type's similar too, tall and lean. So maybe, you know, I'm not meant to, to handle like a linebacker role or a uh, position where you just get beat up all day for sure. Um, so again, I think part of it comes back to that where almost like we're kind of, you're watching the Olympics now, these athletes are kind of picked for their sport. You can't be a gymnast if you're our height, if you're six foot plus, you're not a gymnast. Um, I guess that's kind of going off topic, but I, I think some of the, the injury side of things, again, it comes with um, with sport. I think it's going to happen. Some of the banging collisions, that sort of thing. Um, in terms of, I guess you're saying, kind of being aware of your training. I don't know. I think a lot of athletes just, it's their job. It's what they do. They go out and they train, and it's our job as coaches to be aware of their training. This is maybe their mindset. And and they're just there. I'm at practice for two hours. You're in charge of the drills and what my body does and this and that. You know, maybe at the higher level they have a better uh, sense of awareness. You know, of I'm injured. I need to pull myself out of practice because again, I'm using this job to pay mortgage. So if I get injured and I can't pay mortgage anymore, can't have a house for my kids. Um, but for the younger kids, yeah, I, I think it's just I'm going out. I'm having fun. I'm playing sports. I'm, I'm hurt. I'm hurt. That's what happens in sport. I think that's kind of how their mindset mentality is a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've fallen off my bike and things like skateboards and anything that had a, had wheels on it. I think you, you look at pictures from when I was six till I was 10. I had uh, Band-Aids on my knees uh, fre frequently, maybe 30 percent of the time. If you look at the old pictures, are you uh, similar to, in that respect? Or did you grow up on more grass than uh than uh, blacktop. Um, I mean, either way, grew up outside compared to the kids these days. That's yeah. Sure. yeah. So no, I mean, I grew up same idea. Like you play outside until the you know the sunset or the lights came on, or the street lights came on. So you're at the park, you're at riding your bike, street hockey, playing basketball outside. Yeah, no, without a doubt. So I'll, I'll bring one example up. I approached. Uh, through the uh, emails and phone calls, Brian Bosworth, who was a, a training machine uh, in the 70s and the 80s growing up, and and then he, uh, second year in the pros, at the end of the season, the team doctor said, you're a 23-year-old person with the shoulder joint of a 60-year-old, so you're, you're going to be cut from the team for uh, medical and health reasons, and this is a person who had trained for performance. He said, you know, he said in his, his in his mind, and Mike Tyson might say the same thing, that no one trained harder in my sport than I did. And so, you know, Brian Bosworth, there are pictures of him in his basement. So when he was done with a high school training, he'd go home and, and do more thrusting and more lifting and, you know, try to, try to uh, make himself into a superhuman. My guess is that that was overtraining, but it did train his mind that he could handle almost anything. So it, his excessive training on the body was perhaps strengthening his mind as long as he was still able to play his games. But now, you know, he's about my age. He's in his 50s. The last time I saw a picture of him, uh, he did not look uh, a fit person. He, he was very regretful for some of his behavior. So I'm not criticizing him. I, I actually like him. I like his story, and it's a, it's a captivating story. He went for it, and he got caught up in the, in the marketing a little bit in the hype. But he, here he is my age, and uh, you know I'm not someone who's big and strong like he is, but I'm still doing what I call 18 forever. I'm very fortunate to be able to do uh, you know, handstand push-ups, even though I'm not really built for it, and cartwheels and you know, playful, not just performance and, and weights, but actually play with the balance uh, uh, and the um, competency of, of my physical body. So may, maybe you could share some thoughts on, on the, uh, the injuries and the overtraining you have seen and, and maybe seen in other athletes you haven't trained. Yeah, um, I mean, he, he kind of grew up in an era where it was you just go into the basement and you pound away weights. And I think a lot of people did in the 
you know, late 70s, 80s, 90s, maybe early 2000s where more was better, beat yourself up. Uh, the more weight you could squat, that means you're a better athlete. They assumed things like that. The more you clean, you know, a power clean, that means you're a better football player, <clears throat> which obviously there's no direct correlation with that. But nowadays it's definitely different, without a doubt, 100%. So if you go to um, any of these major conference and clinics and where you get sports scientists that are like, they're measuring data now. They're measuring athletes' heart rates during lifting and sprinting. They're measuring how fast the bar moves. They're, they're doing things they didn't used to do because they're trying to do the complete opposite of what kind of what you were just describing. Like that old school, just go down in the basement and pound away weights with your, with your uncle or something. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't work anymore, which is good. So that's why I think things will change maybe. We'll see, I guess, in 50, 30, 20 years how these athletes are. But, um, you know, like the, the people I kind of interact with, these strength coaches at high school, college, professional organizations, their job now depends on keeping the athletes healthy, actually. So it's not even some, – some of the strength coaches are not even getting paid for how strong they get their athletes anymore. Again, that's kind of almost more 80s, 90s mentality. They're actually getting paid because my athlete can sustain 95% of competition or, or something like that. So, um, yeah, no, but I definitely see that as a good example, the, the Bosworth thing and everybody from that era because that's what they did. They just – pounded weights i mean he took steroids as well so that probably didn't help but um it's different now without a doubt there's more yeah. science involved yeah his his um suggestion on the steroids and he's at least initially was that it, they were prescribed by his doctor because he had back problems from a very young age uh Canseco, um you know i'm going to take some of what he says with a grain of salt a uh, big, strong person, but in, uh, when he was 18, he already had sub substantial back trouble, so his doctor was prescribing the, the steroids for the uh, rehabilitative component, uh, according to what he, he shared. So um, that's interesting, you know, when you've got doctors back in the, in the 80s uh, advising that, and, you know, and who's, who knows what they're doing on a high level, like uh, the Soviets at the time. And uh, many of the teams, the Americans around the world, who knows what they were doing just so that these athletes could endure the, the rigorous training that uh, to you and I might, might be considered overkill and probably in the 80s was most assuredly an uh, overkill. Yeah, I mean, without a doubt. I think the steroids, I mean, you listen to just interviews from people, like Barry Bonds and things like that. It's like, well, steroids didn't make me better. They just made me sustain performance. So I think that's kind of what it was. Like, did Bosworth and Canseco have back problems? And well, yeah, because they were probably the same thing in the basement of their garage, pounding away weights and doing things they shouldn't have done, and you know, a thousand sit-ups a day and things sit, like that. Sit, how about you know? sitting in class all day? I just wrote you know, my first yeah. book's called Sedentary Nation, so it's the right. history of physical movement from the couch potatoes to the hunter gatherers, and and then you know, at the end of that, you you see sitting is the new smoking. And it leads to all kinds of uh, debilitating conditions from the cellular level all the way up to the superstructure. And so the, the sitting in class, you know, I thought that was one of the hardest things about college, uh, just not just brain activity and staying awake, but my long back and my spine was certainly not happy in that. And those tiny little desks that they probably still use. Do they still use those little desks or what do they use at Santa Monica? Yeah, I mean, it's still desks. I mean, right now as I'm speaking to you, I'm, I'm on a – standing desk so we purchased the standing desk and you know my son's only five but we try to get him to stand and do homework so i think that's going to be revolutionary hopefully in the future but no without a doubt you sit all day and your your hip flexors are shortened all day long and you're compressing your lumbar spine all day your limp shuts down yeah yeah i mean you're not moving so <laughs> So that would be an interesting experiment to to uh, actually ask your son a few questions right now about standing and see if he's allowed to keep his own uh, and your own program on standing as much as possible. And, and then once he starts being forced to sit, maybe he is at school already, you ask him about, uh, you know, his his feelings on, on sitting. And then when he's, you know, more talkative at 14 and 20, Ask him, you know, how he's doing in school in the workplace, uh, uh, ver you know, with whatever is required for for his uh, for his situation. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm sure there's definitely a correlation between sitting all day and academic performance and um, attention levels and, you know, um, this Bio, maybe overdiagnosis of ADD and things like that. Yeah, yeah, overdiagnosis. I, you know, you could probably find a correlation. You know, most everything we, we talk about was like 1970s and 80s, the big bad of toxicity in living and less activity. So you could probably find a correlation to more sitting and uh, increases in ADHD, et cetera. So that, I'm sure people are working on that study and have worked on it, um, you know, for the, for the last decade or so. So I'm hopeful, hopefully that will run across my, uh, my Internet search or my book search at, at some point. Uh, you mentioned uh, conditioning. That's a, it's a very interesting word because most people that I know think of conditioning as the penalty in the back of their mind, this might be subconscious and it might be in the conscious part, but a penalty for being inactive all day or a penalty for aging or a penalty for being overweight or just kind of droopy and, and flabby and blobby. So that's what many people that are non-athletes who are non-athletes consider the word conditioning. A kid that's might, you know, no. you're my generation. We're getting a, some feedback there. So, um, yeah. My my um, my look at my my youth and your youth was probably similar was that we I was you know, I knew that recreational movement was actually good for my physique, uh, that it was keeping me more focused. My attention span was better. My uh, biomechanical response to the demands of baseball and golf and all these sports. I knew that the recreational physical playful stuff was good as well as the the sporting performance exercises that that we did and, and you know the field drills etc uh, so there's a big difference between conditioning for play wellness longevity happiness and then conditioning for sports performance and so I was going to ask you in in the books that you read and the conferences you go to do the uh, did the definition change over time, and do the people who speak and write on these subjects talk about conditioning and which particular conditioning that they're they're speaking about uh, in your in your uh, estimation? Um, let's see. Yeah, I think it's still kind of divided into two parts. You know, if you're talking conditioning with pro level, elite level college strength coaches, it's you know it's getting them ready to play on Saturday nights conditioning. But there's a huge movement towards this long-term athletic development concept. So they call it LTAD, long-term long-term athletic development. And really the concept, to break it down, um, comes down to that move when you're young. <laughs> so there's, there's this more of a shift back to this idea of kind of what you're talking about, where kids really should just go out and move and play and move in space and three-dimensional space and – you know, we, we over-specialized kids in the 80s and 90s. I mean, I know I probably did a little bit, but maybe not because I was outside all night, you know, playing random sports. Mm -hmm. um, so that might have started more even in the two, early 2000s, late 90s. Um, but no, I, I think it's, again, starting to change because we're starting to realize the specialization of sport is definitely injuring kids. It's having them burn out quicker. You know, 15-year-old shouldn't just go from loving baseball to hating it. It doesn't really make a lot of sense, but they're hating it because, you know, they're practicing baseball 15, 20 hours a week while they're a student and uh, while they're trying to hang out with friends. And maybe if they kind of grew up just doing different play activities outside, moving more, you know, going to the park more, you go to the park, you there's no way it's as full the playground as it used to be, I feel like, when I grew up. So things like that, um, is, there's more of an emphasis or at least discussion about right now between in academia, I would say, which is good. Yeah, I would I would love to to find out more about that LTAD and, and be be part of this discussion. As I mentioned to you, I'm wired for wellness, so tapping into how I'm wired and the mindset is uh, I, I think will be helpful to these high-performance athletes and to the kids who are sedentary or totally sports performance and perhaps ego-driven to perform. And, you know, Bosworth talked about why he was such a high-performance person was because of the athletes, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, accolades from the people in the crowd. That was his big turn-on. And when that was over, you know, he had to find a new 
Brian inside of the the Boz character he created. So that that's still probably a challenge for him today. Uh, Ken Shamrock, who I was fortunate to to be blessed with an interview and some contact with him post our interview, he's wired for performance, an M MMA fighter. And he knows that, you know, as a kid growing up on this, uh, the, the, the hard, hard road, that the accolades and the acceptance and his own acceptance from himself came from when he was doing well in fighting people uh, in, in football and in wrestling and then eventually in tough man fights and the MMA. All of that was kind of de de developed his persona. Later, you know, he moved uh, or actually in the beginning and then he rekindled his Christianity and his spiritual side. So all this is kind of coming into play now, but he's still in the back of his mind, wants to be a performance athlete in his 50s. So it's an interesting syndrome and I'm, I'm sure it's not uncommon with, uh, with retired and semi-retired uh, high performance athletes yeah I mean that makes sense if you've done something your whole life that's you probably relate to if you've if your dad was a carpenter and you did an apprenticeship with him and watched him do carpentry since you were five I mean you probably would just be doing that your entire life and have a you know have that kind of a part of who you are so it's the same thing I think with athletics I don't think it's too different if you grew up doing this and competing and people told you were great at this and it happens to be athletics, you're probably going to just keep it going. And that's and it's going to affect your mindset, uh, which will in turn kind of keep the wheels spinning. You know, I'm, I'm good at this. I'm going to keep going. Oh, people say I'm good at it. I'm going to keep going harder. Um, no, I mean, I've seen it for sure. You know, I know somebody who was in a silver medalist. Um, Olympic career was done. It was like, now what do I do with my life? Yep. So I, I've seen it for sure. Um, you know, we get junior college football athletes. Like, if I don't play football, I'm literally going to do nothing. And it's like, you're 18 years old. How do you say you're going to do nothing if you don't play football? I mean, you can do anything you want in the world. So I see it every day, without a doubt. You see it every day. I, I Someone taught me a long time ago, and there's a book about this, uh, the fixed mindset versus the open mindset. And I, I run across this every day because people are busy. And when they finally tap into some uh, grain of thought, they oftentimes adopt that because that's the current truth. They speak in absolutes. And to, to do my job as a writer, philosopher, wellness coach, I have to be open to listen. And the more I master one thing, the more I, I, I believe I should be humbled, just like a, you know, a fifth degree black belt in a martial arts. The, the more advanced you get, the more humble you should be and more open minded you should be to, to new wisdom and new, and new thoughts and new feelings from, uh, from others even, and, and even from yourself so that you're not speaking in absolutes. So that, that's something that I'm, running across uh, uh, last uh, last little bit here. The <clears throat> idea that I had um, didn't really come from me. As I mentioned, it was from an orthopedic surgeon. When I was writing Sedentary Nation, he said, for your next book, write the aging athlete because it's a new field in orthopedic medicine. So he's replacing parts and rehabilitating many aging athletes. And an aging athlete could be a 15-year-old whose knee is not healed, whose back is was out of alignment to begin with, and then that 15-year-old injured it substantially. And so, you know, what is an aging athlete? Uh, it's We're all aging from the time we're born. So that's an interesting question. So he said, write the aging athlete. Uh, as I mentioned, the first uh, athlete I connected with was a football player from the 60s and 70s. He's, I, when I met him up in Northern California, a big offensive lineman who still, as he said, recreated in the gym, different mindset five days a week and then played doubles tennis two days a week. So that was the first time I had heard that from someone who was a, a high performance athlete. I recreate in the gym because that's what I do. I consider it a, a joy, an endorphin, a full functionality and, and a good bonding thing with some other people and, and myself with that physical uh, activity. So he shared that. And then I said, when you go to these reunions with the guys from your era, how many are still pursuing regular physical activity? He said less than 10 percent. So that was the, the the big point that I started with. And I, I thought that I was going to see some different statistics on that. But it's I've interviewed probably 500 people and they all say less than 10 percent. And then they multiply that by the 10 people they know. And so that's where I get to this 5000 number in 2016 where we are. And I'll, and I'll probably keep going. So my goal is to change that number to bring about 
awareness to this problem of pursuing a balanced and a well life, whether you do performance later on or not. I'm not saying don't do performance if you're physically, mentally and spiritually and your family and your job and everyone say, you know, you've got you've got the ability and time to do that. That's fine. But I'm saying don't go from being a high performance athlete or a high school person who is really into wrestling to being a sedentary person, a workaholic Super mom and dad, where you put it all, uh, Michael Phelps' mom, I think, is a good example of someone. She's been a principal for decades. Uh, I'm not criticizing her and her performance for her, uh, for her job. I'm, con- I'm criticizing her lifestyle of being unwell and putting it all towards the other people and not towards herself, not getting to know herself and having a balanced lifestyle. And, uh, you know, and it, and it rubs off on Michael, who's had some thoughts of suicide. In my opinion, it rubbed off on him from his father's relationship, etc. So that's where we are on, you know, trying to create, in my opinion, more balanced people. And I think you have to go slow and I think it takes time to do that. So you may Mention your schedule today, so maybe you could tell the audience, you know, what your schedule is and how you're handling it with your 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 school, your family, uh, your speaking engagements, etc. And how does a busy person maintain a well and balanced life? Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> a little busy, just probably like most people these days. I feel like you run into, you know. So um, I just finished teaching an online class. Now I'm trying to prepare for our fall semester starts in two weeks. And kind of prepare the academic side. Like I said, I do academics, teaching, but plus plus the training. So I'm trying to get these programs designed for the athletes that we're going to do in the weight room. You know, running a uh, clinic, an educational clinic for the NSCA while taking care of two little ones. Um, but I think part of it is the difference between working out and training, too. So mm-hmm. a lot of these athletes, they train or they did train. Now they just got to understand what working out is, which again is back more to maybe more playful, just movement, feeling good. Working out or, or, or training doesn't always have to take place. Like it, it could transfer now to this idea of working out where you're having fun. Where you're, so I have a garage gym. The kids are kind of born and raised in our garage gym. If I'm working out in the garage, they're outside drawing with chalk. They're playing with superheroes or they're – riding their bike down the street. So that's just kind of how we fit things in with my lifestyle. My wife does the same thing. We work out in the garage, you know, we'll do intervals running down the street and they just try to chase us down the street. So to me, it's a no brainer, but that's just kind of my lifestyle. That's what we do. That's what we've done. Um, but I know it is different. Cause I mean, even our neighbors look at us like you're working out and your kids are watching you work out. That's crazy. Um, what would be the alternative flip flipping channels and, uh, hanging out with their heads down on their smartphones? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, they still bring the iPad out sometimes when we're working out, but at least they're outside with us. And, um, again, it's part of kind of our lifestyle where we're going to get some kind of fitness in, you know, most days of the week, five days, maybe six days a week, try to get something in just by taking a step outside into the garage and, you know, kind of doing what we do in there. So, so last point, then I'll let you go. <clears throat> I mentioned that uh, University of Nebraska, from someone who uh, went there and is involved in the alumni association, uh, he's the first person to share that a university had a program in their athletic department for the former students. So in Nebraska, as we talked, uh, was known for you know 300-pound offensive linemen for a time, and maybe they still are. So not just the linemen, but all the athletes on the team, big, strong college football players that were uh, who were going out into society, and many were not uh, maintaining for their physical activity, their wellness. They had they had issues that might have included brain trauma, stress, psychological problems, you know, thoughts of ending their lives, all types of things. And so the university took note of that, and they uh, opened up their uh, gym and some of their trainers to engage with these people. And I'm not sure if it was a 365 day a year open invitation, but they at least had uh, an invitation for these people to come back. And, and some of the former athletes took them up on this and went back and, and began to train again. So the first thought in my mind is they're going to be trained on transformation, which is losing weight, getting back into shape. 
is there going to be a point <clears throat> where they go to what I do, which is called maintenance, jack o -lane type stuff. If you were healthy yesterday, you were healthy 10 years ago, you want to maintain that. So <clears throat> that's the question that I have for them, and I hope to learn more about it. And if anyone out there knows about other colleges that, who are uh, who are engaging athletes with seminars at the end of their career or along the way teaching them about wellness applications and a well lifestyle and maintenance fitness uh, and also having uh, retreats where these athletes can come back and experience that and some some training from the, uh, the from the professionals I would love to hear more about it but had you heard anything like that and how important do you think it, it is for these performance oriented physical programs to to teach the wellness component and to invite these athletes back for, uh, for camps and refresher courses? Um, yeah, huh. it's kind of loaded. So there's a couple things going on right now with that part of it. If it's Nebraska, I mean, Boyd Epley, he was the first college strength coach in America, the United States, and he's the, the founder of the NSCA actually. So I'd say that institution more than any other institution would have a connection to um, what's current, what should be happening with student athletes in terms of performance. So that, that's a very unique example probably. But I actually haven't heard of any schools doing anything like that where they invite um, athletes back who aren't competing in the pros, who are just, mm -hmm. you know, I played for your school for four years. Now I'm an accountant and I'm 45 years old and I got four kids. You want to come back and work out with us? I've personally never heard of that myself. Mm -hmm. Um, will, will it happen? I don't know. I don't see it happening per se, to be honest with you. Um, the people I hang out with and know probably are so consumed and busy with training the regular day to day athletes that are on scholarship that yeah. they would almost have to have like a separate position, separate mm -hmm. program, which would make sense. But, um, also a lot of these athletes, like say at the college level, if you're playing football at Nebraska, I'd say a huge chance you're not living in Nebraska once you graduate. Yeah. You know, so there's, a, again, there's kind of a lot going on with that. Um, I think coaches are, are doing a good job of teaching them, teaching these young athletes these days, at least lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So they're talking about sleep. I don't think they used to do much of that, maybe in the 80s and 90s, 70s. They're talking about nutrition. Um, I, I know they didn't do as much of that back in the day because it's so comprehensive nowadays. They have nutrition programs for every single athlete you know, 400 athletes in a department and they all have nutrition plans. So they're, they're going that route these days. Um, it's still more performance related. It's not necessarily wellness or longevity related. Uh, but yeah, no, it'd be interesting if they were able to bridge the gap between current performance and long-term health longevity. It'd be a project. That's for sure. It, it would take more resources. I'll tell you that right now. Mm -hmm. And it would take more manpower and more money. That's for sure. So we're going to wind this down. Um, I'm Sifu Slim with uh, Coach Matt Hank. And uh, if you could share your website with the listeners and also the fact that they can get your list of preferred and recommended books for your kinesiology and your, and your athletic training folks. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, your list I'm, I'm sure will be expanding. And the aging athlete would love to be part of your list and perhaps sedentary nation. So how does one jump on your list and, and tell the audience about your website and, and your list of uh, recommended books? Yeah, so I, I feel like I try to continue my edu education as much as I can and stay on top of kind of what's current in terms of reading. So I have a website, just matthank.com. Um, it's more academic based right now. I use for my students and I kind of guide them there. And one of the things is just my book list that I put up there, and it's more performance related, but there are other um, kind of wellness books and um, personal growth type of books as well, for sure. So I just kind of keep that going. It'll be also linked to our um, strength and conditioning website that's starting to get up and running here sh shortly, which will be good. Um, yeah, that's the best way to kind of contact, find my contact information is matthank.com. So if people... Uh out in the uh, blogosphere internet uh, world want to uh, in, in learn some of what you've learned and, and interact with people who have a, uh, you know, an athletically schooled background uh, in training and kinesiology background, uh, what would you recommend to them? And t does Santa Monica need more students in your department? 
Um, yeah. Well, yeah, if I was administration, yeah, I'm sure they would be selling you on that right now. Yeah, no, I think every <laughs> college needs, they want more students. Um, no, but if you're specifically interested in, in fitness and wellness, yeah, that, that'd be one of the first steps. Get into a kinesiology department, into a program. A lot of people hear kinesiology, they don't even know what that means. So that'd be a first step. It's kind of understanding what that encompasses, which is a lot, really anything movement-based. Uh, but then being a part of these different organizations, again, like the NSCA that I'm a part of, but there's a, there's a ton of them and, and there's a ton of different personal training, fitness, uh, there's wellness certifications nowadays. And um, so there's a lot of specialty um, kind of niches out there in the field. That, that's a first step maybe for some people without going back into the education setting, at least the formal education maybe. So. Do, do I, when I um, had the chance to interact with you a few times now, do I come across differently than the, than the folks who are in academia and in these organizations uh, because I'm an independent writer who's uh, started out as a wellness person and kind of put my thoughts together with the help of lots of the, uh, the books and the, and the videos from the people on the inside. But my thought is that perhaps <clears throat> my stance is, is, is different in many ways than the people on the inside. Yeah. Um, I mean, without a doubt, we see that. I see that with um, personal trainers and strength coaches because we're the ones day to day that train athletes, communicate with them, know what's going on. And it's hard because in the academic side, the research side of things, that's what they're doing. They're, they're teaching people about these textbooks and then they're doing research and their research is usually one step behind what we're actually doing and communicating with people and with athletes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they know that and they say that and they're always trying to catch up to us. But the, the gap is getting closer, which is good. You know, there's the academic arena and the actual, I guess, kind of performance side and what's going on in real life is starting to bridge together, which is which is a good thing. Wonderful. So we're, uh, we're pleased to have had some time to speak with uh, Coach Matt Hank, Southern California currently, matthank.com with two Ts. And I'm Sifu Slim, sifuslim.com, S-I-F-U, slim.com, or theagingathlete.com. And we'd be pleased with your comments, and we are open to learn and, and hear your stories. And if you want to contact us through our websites, um, we, we can't just hang out and, and have conversations with you till the cow comes home. But if you've got specific things and we do have time uh, to uh, connect with you on that or you want to participate in a future webinar or a, a conference, uh, we would be happy to keep your email in the loop on that. So I'm, I'm Sifu Slim and, and Matt Hank, and we uh, are pleased to have connected with you today.